Good morning. I really can't express the, the joy and gratitude that it is for me to be here this morning. <clears throat> Excuse me. It, it is just as Ken has said, all of those reasons. There's one other major reason, and that is that I also met my wife here at, uh, when I was serving as first as the co-director of the Inn with, when Marta, Bennett, and I were temporarily stepping in for a couple of years to take the place of Steve Hayner, who had gone off to start his PhD. So it really is just this long, long and deep connection with this church. I couldn't tell my story without telling the story of UPC. I couldn't tell it because it would have to exclude people that have been so formational to me, people that have tracked with me since before I was at UPC, but certainly during that time and long, long, long after. I called Cheryl Hayner yesterday to just have a few moments of reminiscence about the time that Steve and Cheryl were here, for those of you who knew them. I'm having lunch today with Tim and Carrie Dearborn who were here on the staff at the time that I arrived. So we're not gonna spend the time really having all this nostalgia, but I just, have to say one primary thing, thank you. Thank you to UPC. So many of the most foundational elements, my first, the first church I had ever been deeply a part of, it, the first place that I ever preached a sermon, the first place that I ever had a chance to be in regular ministry, the place where I received God's call because of the peculiar question of someone then on the staff of this church who asked me, what is the question that you most wish people would ask you but they hardly ever do? And I said, I wanna think about that. I came back the next day, I said, you know, I think it's this. I want people to ask me about what is the center of your passion? And the reason I wanted people to ask about that was because I wanted a chance to tell them about the, the reality of Jesus Christ as the one who holds all things and the one who gives life in the midst of circumstances of every kind of need and a God whose heart and mind and soul and strength is for me but also for the world and it's in that reality that that it was clear to me that that was actually what I most wanted to do so it was here on this very place different stones at the time and on this very place in a packed sanctuary at 10 o'clock every Tuesday night there was an, a service that was then called the inn and it was in that context that week after week, Marta and I would rotate the preaching and experience the, the reality of the weirdness of a gathering of so many students late at night on Tuesdays. It is a place that has given me gift after gift after gift. There were times when I was in seminary where I just felt like I barely had money to exist, honestly. It was just like thinner than thin. And then out of nowhere would come another gift from UPC that helped me take another series of steps. It was, it was really because of this church, the people, the commitment, the, the institution, the fact that it was here that I was ordained. It only made sense to me, even though I had been called to be the, the, the university pastor at First Press in Berkeley, it was here that I was most grounded and called in my own sense of what God had set for me to do and to be. So thank you, UPC. Thank you for being a faithful university church. Thank you for taking seriously your context in Seattle. Thank you for seeing the world. Thank you for keeping your heart and mind focused on Jesus Christ. Thank you for committing yourselves to the emergence of younger leaders who needed the encouragement and vision and support that really it takes a congregation to provide. And that was provided by this congregation in my own life. So more than anything else, if you don't even hear anything else, this is what I most want you to hear. Simply thank you and thanks be to God for University Presbyterian Church. Let's pray. Oh God, I look out this morning and see faces that are familiar and many that are not, known entirely by you and in, on this corner, in this place, in this town, in this city, next to this campus, in this region, this congregation has been and is a church that is committed to you, committed to the reality of the gospel in all of its fullness, committed to the longing and possibility of being people who become more and more human because of how you can transform us. More and more a reflection of what it means to be faithful disciples following Jesus Christ more and more 
yeast in the world, in all the places that we work and play and study and do research and create. Oh God, in your mercy, we give you thanks. And we pray now as we give ear to your word that we'll have ears to hear. And that hearing we would again be renewed, renewed in the core of our being to the reality to which you're calling us. The reality that is God's love in Jesus Christ for our sake and for the sake of the world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Romans chapter 12 is a chapter that is familiar to probably many of you this morning. You know that it's a chapter that is a pivotal chapter. We'll be reflecting a bit on that. I'd like to read it and if you uh, would just follow along. I know sometimes it's your tradition to stand, but it's a fairly long reading. So I'll spare you and just read it as you sit. The Apostle Paul writes, I appeal to you therefore brothers and sisters by the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body, we have many members and not all the members have the same function. So we who are many are one body in Christ and individually we are members one of another. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us prophecy in proportion to faith, ministry in ministering, the teacher in teaching, the exhorter in exhortation, the giver in generosity, the leader in diligence, the compassionate in cheerfulness. Let love be genuine, hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good, love one another with mutual affection, outdo one another in showing honor, do not lag in zeal, be ardent in spirit. Serve the Lord, rejoice in hope, be patient in suffering, persevere in prayer, contribute to the needs of the saints, extend hospitality to strangers. In Romans chapters one through eight, Paul lays out God's cosmic plan and it's a cosmic plan that involves everything from creation to the, to the time in which Jesus Christ does for us what no one and nothing else could possibly do to rescue and redeem us first and foremost from ourselves, but also from those principalities and powers, those influences of darkness that in some way or another hold us captive. Paul couldn't be happier and more joyful to be able to share this deep, rich, good news it involves nothing less than the life and death and resurrection of the incarnate Son of God. It is the reason why Paul himself turns from his history of great personal interest in his own pedigree as a Jew to become a person who now in brokenness, in surrender of that pedigree, turns to Jesus Christ and places his life in God's hands in a new and fresh way. Chapters nine to 11 are chapters that really talk about how God relates and understands Israel and the ongoing work that God is doing to fulfill the promises and purposes that God has for Israel. And then by the time we come to chapter 12, it's as though we could imagine a set of letters as high as the ceiling and it says, therefore, it is an enormous turning point. Paul's use of this very simple Greek word is simply to gather up all of this narrative in one through 11 and say in light of all of this reality, which is true of God, true of our humanity, true of the church, true of Israel, true of the, the work that God is now doing in and through the church, all of that history is gathered up and now Paul wants to say, therefore, 
it's like a, it's a hinge text. In light of all of this mercy of God, therefore, it has consequences. Not therefore, say thanks only, but therefore, let all that has preceded this reshape everything about your life. And so he starts, as a pastor does, realizing that this is a deep work. This is not a superficial thing. This is not a stamp or a badge that we wear. This is not a simple sign of a card that we sign or a happy moment. This is the pivot point of reality. Reality, capital R, all reality, including our reality, including my reality. And Paul says, therefore, I beg you, my brothers and sisters, this is a a plea of urgency. Paul here is really the apostle, the evangelist, but he's also the pastor. He's really urging them to say, take this with full and deep seriousness. Therefore, I beg you, I plead with you, I urge you. All of these are words that are used to translate this kind of Greek word. This strong sense that this really matters. Therefore, don't just say, got it, and move on. Now, this is actually the core out of which all of life is meant to come. Therefore, I beg you, my brothers and sisters, as an act of intelligent worship. Here, what he's naming is, this is actually what it means to conceive and understand, to perceive reality clearly, to perceive God, to perceive ourselves, to perceive the people of God, to perceive the world. world. Therefore, I beg you, do not be conformed, people go on to say, to this world but be transformed with the renewing of your mind. So we first present our lives as a living sacrifice. Here Paul's saying, the consequences of all this is that you are called to offer everything up. This has always been God's word to the people of Israel. And it certainly is now God's word to the church. Present everything you've got. Worship is a full body experience. Worship is a full life experience. It's a comprehensive work that involves every dimension of our life. It involves as much our work as it involves what happens in the sanctuary. It's about the liturgy, but it's also about the liturgy of our lives. It's about friendship. It's about neighborliness. It's about sacrifice. It's about gifting. It's about the purposes and calling of anything and everywhere that we might be. Therefore, he says, present your whole selves as a living sacrifice. Holy, set apart that is, acceptable. Holy, acceptable and perfect. It's an amazing sense that these are words, holy, acceptable and perfect, all of which are made possible because of Jesus Christ. I'm not and you're not inherently holy, acceptable and and good. But by Jesus Christ, we are. And then, like a good pastor, he says, but friends, I have to give you a warning. This is a serious warning because I know just at the moment that I'm saying, present your whole bodies as a living sacrifice, that actually there will be pressures to do just the opposite. So he then turns in a warning-like way and says to, his disciples, to those who he's writing to in Rome, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Paul's very aware that there's a strong sense that what's happening here is that that there's going to be a pushback. You don't make the kind of offering of your whole lives that Paul's describing here without the pushback. It begins with worship and there will be a pushback to a meaningful life of sacrifice. Because if we're actually offering ourselves, giving ourselves away, if we're actually laying down our rights and taking up the reality of what it means to live as a free person, in the grace of God, where the gifts that we've been given have been given in order to be given away. If you start living in that kind of way, it will have consequences. It will have social consequences. It will be a strange thing for people that are around you. There will be a pushback, an anxiety. Don't do that. Oh, you're going too far. Have you joined a cult? Whatever it might be, all of that is actually possible. And the church has sometimes been guilty of all of those things. But the reaction is not to stop being a living sacrifice. The reality is to get clear about to whom and to what are we offering our lives. And to be clear about what that means, not as a surrendering of our mind, 
but actually as an engagement of our mind. And all of that is partly why here, then he says, now wait, do not be conformed to this world. Here he's using the word world in a technical sense that's not about uh, the physical existence of, of the planet and, etern- and the universe that's around us, but it's a reference instead to the fallen world. Don't surrender yourself to culture would be actually another way of putting it. Don't surrender yourself to just the stuff that comes to you from the surrounding environment in which you live. Be aware of it. Do not conform yourself to that, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Transformation is God's business. It's his number one business. After creation itself, it's transformation that God is principally occupied with. God's work every day is the transformation of the whole created order into the purposes for which God had initially designed it. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing or the renewal of your mind. Mind here is not a word that means brain. It means something more like perception. Be transformed by the renewing of your whole perception of the world, which yes, includes our minds, it includes our intellects, it includes the full engagement of our capacities for reason, but it also involves our whole perceptions, which are as much often bodily as they are mental. It's not just my perceptions that have to do with my analysis, but how I actually live in the world, my perceptions of moving close or moving away, my temptation to live in fear or to live in freedom, my temptation to live in bondage or to live in a context where God has released us in order to be able to live the life that God's called us to. For Paul, these are the foundation stones. He's gonna go on, as you heard, to talk about the church and the whole of chapter 12 is really about the church. But let's just say, before getting to the church, Paul wants to set some terms. Because it just turns out the church is sort of gonna be, have you noticed, a complicated thing. It's just a little bit complicated. It's a little wonderful and a little problematic. And it always has been. It was true of Israel. It's true of the church. Before he gets to that, this framing is so critical. I beg you, my brothers and sisters, in light of all of God's mercy, to present your whole selves as a living sacrifice, not to the church. We are not called to sacrifice ourselves to the church. We sacrifice ourselves to God. And in the light of the sacrifice to God, we then become part of the church in which we are meant to then live as distinct and new creations. And how do we show that we're a new creation? By not being conformed to this world, but by being transformed by the renewing of your mind, that we may prove what is the will of God. In other words, it translates into action, that we may prove what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. These are amazing framing words. He'll come in just a moment. We'll take a moment to look at those texts. It's just that pivot. So before we go further, I just want to ask you, how are you doing in your life as living sacrifices? Is it clear that it's to God that you're offering yourselves daily? It's the source of life. It is the place in which we find the deepest satisfaction. Not as a pure act of mechanical worship, but as a deep soulish offering of our being. One of the prayers I try to pray as many times a day as I can is the simple Jesus prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. It's just a breath prayer. It's just a prayer that accompanies me every single day in countless contexts. I couldn't imagine being the president of Fuller Seminary without praying that prayer about a thousand times a day. It's not because I am the worst of all people as though I need to constantly repent. It's that I am so dependent on the reality of God's love and I wanna offer myself, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me. How do we enact and practice it? Not just in our words or in our thoughts, but then in our actions that we might demonstrate, prove what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. 
Mind is a very important word in this text. So how, is, how are we doing in our worship? How are we doing in the transformation or renewing of our mind, of our perception? We're born into the world with all kinds of skills which scientists and uh, sociologists all along the way have been speaking so clearly about the deep formation that happens before we ever really become even self-conscious. It's an amazing thing how much formation has already happened prenatally. One of the things that my boys sometimes bug me about is that when I see a baby and I love babies, I love babies. There are no grandchildren in our family, but I love babies. And, and when I look at a baby, one of the things that always just staggers me is that they're all there. It's just the most amazing thing. This tiny little entity, they're all there. And the makings of their life are going to unfold from what is there right now as they are in that cradle or in our arms or screaming their lungs out. They are all there. But in fact, over the course of our lives, many other sociological, educational, economic, racial, gendered facts will, aff aff uh, 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 will attach themselves to us, will shape us, will form us, will dis they will affect the way that we perceive. A number of years ago, I was in a serious bicycle accident and uh, I got an infection on my brain. It wasn't clear that I was gonna survive. My left eye was pushed back in my head an inch and down in my head an inch. It was a very bloody, dramatic thing. I'd like to say that it happened on the Champs-Elysees wearing the yellow jersey uh, <laughs> coming toward the goal, but actually I was just on a flat bike path in Alameda, California. This is like as much of a bicycle non-event as you could possibly have. And in that moment, a bike stopped in front of me. I went up on my uh, front tire and my face was squarely over the end of the vertical handlebar. And as a result, I, I thought I had lost my eye. By God's grace, I didn't, but it took over a year and many, many surgeries and many months of just laying flat with no light and as little sound around me as possible in order to be able to actually get through this process of restoration. One day in that process, I felt God say to me, you know, Mark, I, I will restore your sight, but there's something much more important that's needed than simply the restoration of your sight. What's really needed is the changing of your vision. That is, I need to change how you perceive me, how you perceive your family, how you perceive your calling, how you perceive your neighbors, how you perceive the world. Do not be conformed to this rule, but be transformed by the renewing of our perception. One of the gifts of being a university church is that you have the opportunity and privilege of being in an environment in which there are so many people who are committing themselves to thoughtful exercise. The academic enterprise is a serious one and I was shaped in part by UPC, but the fact that you were a thinking congregation, that actually being a thoughtful Christian was not an oxymoron, that actually it was possible to be both thoughtful and Christian. And over the course of the years, I'm aware of how much the church benefits from thoughtful Christians and how impoverished and distorted the church can be when so often the church becomes almost the product of unthinking Christian faith. That is not what Paul's talking about here. And it's not talking about turning the Christian faith into a brainiac exercise like Presbyterians who can sometimes seem like we're brains on sticks. That's not the goal either. The goal is to actually just take the reality of reason, the reality of perception, the lenses by which we see and miss see God and the world and one another and allow the Holy Spirit, the scriptures, to actually do that work of deep renewing of our perception. When any of us think about some of the people that have been the most influential in our lives as Christian disciples, I bet that it includes people who just somehow seem to have a clearer vision than others seem to have about what actually really matters. That is a process of change, a process of transformation. It doesn't happen in the twinkling of an eye. It happens over time, it happens through pain, it happens through suffering, it happens through faithfulness. Those are the contexts in which we become new creatures. I wanna tell you about a woman in our church in Berkeley named Doris. 
Doris at the time of this story was in her mid 80s. She was a tall, elegant Presbyterian lady, the kind of, the kind of woman that had her hair done at, at 11 on Friday every week. Doris, she was magnificent. She was also unbelievably gritty. One day I hear in the middle of the morning that, that somehow Doris on her arrival at church had been attacked. I didn't know what that meant. I didn't know how serious it was. I didn't know what had happened after that. But I discovered that she was home and after the last service, I immediately went to her apartment to check in on her and understand what was going on. And she invited me in. You could see that she was flustered and a bit distorted in, in how she was operating. She invited me to sit down, offered me coffee and tea, all the classic things that Doris at 85 would do. And I said, Doris, I, I don't know what happened at all. I don't know the, any of the details, but something terrible happened this morning. Is that right? Yeah, she said, you know, you know that place where I park? I did, I knew exactly where she parked. You know that place where I parked? Well, I had just parked there. And then I was reaching from the driver's side across to the passenger seat to get those nut muffins. You know those nut muffins that I was always bring? Well, I was just bringing those nut muffins to the fellowship group. And in the context of reaching across and trying to get the nut muffins, suddenly I was struck from behind, pushed across the driver's seat, across the console into the passenger seat. And I still had my keys in my hand. And so this person grabbed the keys in my hand and put them in the ignition and suddenly took, I, I said, what is going on? Who are you? Note to self, when being kidnapped, ask your kidnapper's name. It was Jesse. So Doris says, Jesse, what's happening? I'm going to take some money from you. We're going to make some bank stops. Why do you need money? Because I'm a drug addict. That's a terrible thing that you're a drug addict, she said to him. You should really not be a drug addict. It's a terrible thing to do to your life. Right, he said, and with that he, coerced her into giving her his, her passcode, giving him her, her passcode and taking out the first uh, dole of money. They do that, comes back to the car to make two more stops. Eventually along the way, she's saying how really, really terrible it is to be a drug addict. He says, yes, I know. But she says, you need a really good drug rehab program. He said, yes, I know, but I've, I've been in lots of drug rehab programs, but none of them have done anything. She says, okay, and they make another stop, they make another stop, finally they're done. He's about to leave her by the side of the road. She can't get out of the car. And she says, Jesse, I can't get out of the car. So he comes around to the passenger side of the car and opens the door and escorts her around to the driver's side. He helps her into the car, lifts up her legs, puts the seatbelt across her, and then leans in and gives her a kiss on the cheek. She said, Jesse, I'm gonna pray that you get arrested. This is terrible. Have you ever done this to somebody else? This is awful. You shouldn't do this. It's awful that you're a drug addict and it's awful that you're kidnapping people and stealing from them. I'm going to pray that you get kidnapped. But secondly, you need a really good drug rehab program. There are good ones and bad ones. I know that. And there are some good ones. I'm going to make sure that you get a good drug rehab program. And thirdly, you need Jesus. The judge can't take care of that, but I can. not We're going to talk. And with that, he was off. I said, Doris, that's just an unbelievable story. She said, I know. I mean, I, as, I was, as it was all in front, I kept thinking, but there's probably other people that are being kidnapped today. Note to self, when being kidnapped, remind yourself that you're in the fellowship of the kidnapped. So that happens. Sure enough, two weeks later, she's called in uh, for a lineup. Sure enough, there was Jesse third from the left. I go with her to the courtroom on the day that she's going to testify. She's sitting in the box and she's sort of, you know, half waves to Jesse and says, hey, Jesse, it's me, Doris. Remember, we had that time in the car. It's me, Doris. We had that time in the car. Well, Judge, it's true he's guilty of everything. And it's also true that he needs, first of all, a really good drug rehab program. He's been given bad ones. Do not give him a bad one. And he needs Jesus. I'll take care of that. So he was in a local jail. Doris visited him for as long as he was there, which was about eight or nine months almost every week, just to say how grateful she was to have a chance to tell him about the love of God. Now, the deeper story behind why a person could be Doris in that moment is a story of suffering. It's a story of having her feet on the ground as a disciple in real times and in real places. It's about being mindful of a world beyond herself that's primary, not just her own experience, not just as it were her victimhood. I never even heard her 
talk about that. It was just the incident with Jesse and her concern that Jesse know a God who could redeem him in the face of his alcoholism and drug abuse and in the face of, of the life that he had chosen to live. Friends, this is a sign, just one of countless thousands and millions and millions of signs of people who in their ordinary places have taken this text seriously like Doris did and allowed not only her worship to be a daily way of engaging the reality around her but a way of changing her perception so that as she saw herself and as she saw her neighbor even in this case her enemy she saw him in a different way than she would ever have been able to do otherwise and in the context of that she was an offering to the church and to the world. If we had longer, I would love to go through more of this text. Paul gives granular, practical, specific words of exhortation. Let this actually show up. In a period which is as bad as almost any period in American church history, the one that we are currently living in, where the church is frayed and broken and divided and hostile in so many different ways. The question I think this text brings me and I hope brings all of us is this question, are we really actually seeking to live a life of sacrificial worship? And are we willing to be transformed by the renewing of our perception that we might actually show up in real time and places as different people with a different aroma, with a different capacity to love, to forgive, to see and to understand. Will God give you new vision? That's Paul's confidence that God longs to answer this. We offer ourselves that God of all mercy and goodness and justice is a God who will renew our hearts and minds that we might act as though the gospel is actually true. Lord, in your name, we offer you this. These are challenging, challenging words. They're awakening words. They are words of reality that, that invite us into a space that the world around us suggests doesn't even exist. And yet, in light of the affirmations of scripture, it is the reality which is meant to define all other reality. So in your name, take these words, seal them in our hearts, that we might be people who worship and who are renewed as though the gospel is really true. Amen.